diesen doch sehr starken Appell. Es ist ja in dieser Grundsatzrede oder in dieser Keynote-Speech schon angeklungen, ähm, die Türkei spielt selbstverständlich eine außerordentlich wichtige Rolle. Und wenn man nur mal ganz kurz drüber nachdenken will, was sich alles verschoben und verändert hat in dieser Region, dann lassen Sie uns mal kurz drüber nachdenken, wie vor 15 Jahren man die Türkei empfunden hätte. Gewiss nicht, hätte es eine Tagung gegeben zum Nahen Osten. Ich bin noch nicht mal ganz sicher, ob man die Türkei dazu eingeladen hätte. Und jetzt ist es vollkommen klar, es geht nicht mehr nur um die Türkei und die EU, es geht ganz klar um die Gestaltungsfähigkeiten, vielleicht auch Gestaltungspflichten, die die Türkei innerhalb der Region hat. Sie ist ganz sicherlich vom Syrien-Konflikt am unmittelbarsten betroffen. Das beginnt mit der enormen Anzahl von Flüchtlingen, die von den türkischen Behörden erstmal versorgt werden muss. Und das geht weiter zu einer vielleicht sogar faktischen Installierung einer No-Fly-Zone, indem man eben Patriot-Raketen in Stellung bricht. Ich darf ähm, hier auch gerne einen, mit großem Vergnügen einen Keynote-Redner ankündigen, Professor Soli Ösel, der eigentlich ausgebildeter Ökonom ist, ähm, unter anderem auch an der John Hopkins ähm, war und jetzt Senior Lecturer an der Kadir Hass Universität in Istanbul ist. Herr Ösel, darf ich Sie auf die Bühne bitten? Es dauert immer ein kleines bisschen, bis die Übersetzung ankommt. Good afternoon. Darkness descends upon the Arab world. Waste, death, and destruction attend a fight for a better life. Outsiders compete for influence and settle accounts. The peaceful demonstrations with which this began, the lofty values that inspired them, become distant memories. Elections are festive occasions where political visions are an afterthought. The only consistent program is religious and is stirred by the past. A scramble for power is unleashed without clear rules, values, or endpoint. It will not stop with regime change or survival. History does not move forward, it slips sideways. Games occur within games, battles against autocratic regimes, a Sunni Shiite confessional clash, a regional power struggle, a newly minted Cold War. Nations divide, minorities awaken, sensing a chance to step out of the state's confining restrictions. The picture is blurred. These are but fleeting fragments of a landscape still coming into its own, with only scrappy hints of an ultimate destination. The changes that are now believed to be essential are liable to be disregarded as mere anecdotes on an extended journey. New or newly invigorated actors rush to the fore. The ill-defined street, prompt to mobilize, just as quick to disband. Young protesters, central activists during the uprising, wrote skill in its wake. The Muslim brothers yesterday dismissed by the West as dangerous extremists are now embraced and feted as sensible, business-like pragmatists. The more traditionalist Salafis, once allergic to all forms of politics, are now eager to compete in elections. There are shadowy armed groups and militias of dubious allegiance and unknown benefactors, as well as gangs, criminals, highwaymen, and kidnappers. Alliances are topsy-turvy, defy logic, are unfamiliar and shifting. Theocratic regimes back secularists, tyrannies promote democracy, the US forms partnerships with Islamists, Islamists support Western military intervention. Arab nationalists side with regimes they have long combated. Liberals side with Islamists with whom they then come to blows. Saudi Arabia backs secularists against the Muslim brothers and Salafis against secularists. The US is allied with Iraq, which is allied with Iran, which supports the Syrian regime, which the US hopes to help topple. The U.S. is also allied with Qatar, which subsidizes Hamas, and with Saudi Arabia, which funds the Salafis, who inspire jihadists, who kill Americans wherever they can. In record time, Turkey evolved from having zero problems with its neighbors to nothing but problems with them. It has alienated Iran, angered Iraq, and had a row with Israel. It virtually is at war with Syria. Iraqi Kurds are now Ankara's allies even as it wages war against its own Kurds, 
and even as its policies in Iraq and Syria emboldened secessionist tendencies in Turkey itself. That wasn't me. <laughs> My picture is not as dark as this one, but this is... This is uh, from uh, the beginning of, uh, of a rather brilliantly written but very, very pessimistic and dark article co-authored by Hussein Aga and uh, Robert Malley, published in the New York Review of Books, issue September, November 7. I do recommend those of you who do read English and who can access it, and I don't think you have to be a, a subscriber to it. It is, it is a very heart-hitting and uh, eye-opening uh, article. Yet, if these are the cards we are dealt, we really have to think about what is going on and see what we can do. I'm not necessarily going to speak about the intricacies of Turkish foreign policy, although at the end I will talk about Turkish foreign policy and what I consider to be its fundamental mistakes since the beginning of the Syrian case, if not earlier. But I think, first of all, we've got to put into perspective historically what it is that we're witnessing. Again, very often when I listen to or speak with colleagues from either Europe or the United States, there is a very curious amnesia about the history of the last hundred years. There is a very convenient absence of memory when it comes to the issue of colonialism. There is a very kind of aggravating sense of bewilderness that bewilders me about who's responsible for what. And so long as what's going on in the region is treated, they are doing this, what the hell are we supposed to do? I doubt that we can get anywhere. Secondly, I think it is also, especially for Europe, a mistake to think that the Middle East, by the way, I mean, part of the Middle East is neither Middle or East. You know, North Africa is South and West. It isn't out there. It is part of Europe, demographically, geographically. So and as I'll say what I'm going to say at the end. We really have to have a different language to discuss these matters. We really have to have a new framework within which to see what is going on. Now, one can understand and even empathize with Europe, you know, like, you know, Greece is burning, you know, maybe Spain will follow. God knows what will happen if Italy slips. Germany is trying to hold everything and then uh, it cannot really be liked by anyone because it is demanding Protestant uh, guilt on, from Orthodox and the Catholics. Um, but the thing is, we really, we, really must, we really must look at things differently. The way I see what's going on is as follows. What we are witnessing is indeed the unraveling of the post-Ottoman system in the Middle East, an order that was created to the south of Turkey by the British and the French, mainly by the British, and I think in North Africa, the unraveling of the colonial order from the mid-19th centuries onward. And as you know from your history, as we know from our history, the collapse or the breakup of empires is never a fun thing to watch. It's too bloody, it's too dirty, whatever. But it, there is an unraveling of the post-Ottoman system. So far, only republics appear to have been impacted by it. The monarchies seem to be doing fine, but whether or not monarchies are going to continue to be doing fine it remains an important question. We'll see. Okay. So what's going on? I think we can... Uh, this unraveling has started 
at least in embryonic form, with the first Gulf War. That is when a grand coalition pushed Saddam Hussein, forced Saddam Hussein to withdraw its troops from Kuwait. Then the Americans stood by when the rebellions took place, and then public pressure led them to enforce no-fly zones in the north and the south. And there you had the embryonic Kurdish state to begin with. The net effect of the American war against Iraq was to destroy the Iraqi regime's fundamental construction and along with it what I believe to be the fundamental construction of the post-Ottoman order put together by the British, which depended on the unquestioned and absolute supremacy of Sunni Arabs over non-Sunnis and non-Arabs. Therefore, with the Iraq war, we have the unraveling of an order and basically unleashing of forces that had been kept in one fashion or another, either in colonial times or post-colonial Cold War authoritarian times, under a lot of pressure. Okay. What we're seeing today is the rise, and as uh, Aga and Mali have very poetically pr uh, presented, the rise of subnational networks, the rise of Kurdish nationalism that is regional and cross-border. We are witnessing weakening states. The, p the uh, paper that was given to us about the uh, erosion of order in Sinai was extraordinarily telling in that sense. We have, we're seeing weakening states in an age of dwindling developmental resources globally and at a time of demographic explosion in an Arab world whose birth rates have collapsed, but nonetheless the momentum of the population growth is still there. Under such circumstances, there are really many more questions than answers. I can come up with a hundred questions and I don't believe anybody can really judiciously give answers to those questions. Some of them are, as the old order unravels, what kind of order are we to expect? Can the borders that are, by all definitions, artificial borders, really hold? Is the sectarian conflict that is part of the state adversity and rivalry compatible with a regional state system? Can Israel hold its own in the way it is constituted? I mean, at the end of the day, Israel is a product of the post-Ottoman settlement and British imperial domination. That is what the geography has come up, has been created, uh, how it's been created. And if Israel cannot hold its own in the way it is constituted today, which direction will it go? Especially at a time when the two-state solution is being treated more as a fantasy or increasingly more as a fantasy than a viable political option. What are the questions that are being raised in Israel? Is it going to be what the Arabs or what the Palestinians in particular said all along? The Crusaders came, stayed for a hundred years, and then departed. Is that the kind of times we're still living in? And as I said earlier, how long can the monarchies hold? Why do they hold? Is it still international patrons that keep them in place? Is it immense resources, that is, oil rents that keep them in place? Or is it their domestic configurations, their ability to make alliances with a variety of groups that one way or another maintain these ties to the rulers? Syria is the crystallizer of both the sectarian and the ethnic dimension of a regional cum global power struggle. Syria is a mirror. What goes on in Syria is not just about the freedom and justice that were sought by a large portion of the population for some time now. What had begun as a peaceful political opposition movement 
faced with, a brutal, with the unnecessary brutality of the regime, has now turned not just into a civil war, but also turned Syria into the playground of regional power games, global power games, and all of them wrapped in sectarian language. So the question to ask is, and when you think about it, and the, uh, I think Mr. Fuchs mentioned Bosnia, Yugoslavia, The territories that have, in the last 20 years, have been subjected to brutal breakups, separations that were bloody, are all territories of the Ottoman Empire in its last 30, 40 years. In a way, what happened in Yugoslavia a place that remained multi-ethnic and multi-confessional, multi-religious, because of the Cold War, for whatever reason, that unraveling and the language that was used is partially resembling, or at least is reminiscent of, or what is going on in Syria is reminiscent of what goes on in in Bosnia, is that final post-Ottoman resolution which is not confined only to drawing boundaries and creating political entities, but also homogenizing communities, is that what we're witnessing, the, what the final phase of in Syria, is a, worth, is a question, in my judgment, worth asking. We're now faced between, we're now faced with, or we're caught between bad and worse alternatives at this point in time. Russia's gambling... The West is impotent and actually unwilling to intervene. Turkey, with its policies in Syria over the last 20 months, has faithfully exposed to the rest of the world the dramatic gap between its desires, ambitions, and goals, and its capacity. A question Does anybody really care about Syrians so long as things don't get out of hand? I cannot, in my heart, answer this question in the affirmative. Add to all of this the energy resources of Eastern Mediterranean. Is the Syrian conflict, if not explicitly, implicitly related to that resource distribution that is likely to come in Eastern Mediterranean as well, which will render Eastern Mediterranean, for for a whole other set of reasons, a very important economically strategic uh, region. And there, of course, you don't just have Arab countries, you don't just have Israel, you don't just have Turkey, you also have Cyprus, which is a member of the European Union which is a wholly paid subsidiary of the Russian Federation, whose oil and gas are being explored by American companies that have Israeli participation. It really makes a good script for a wonderful adventure movie. (laughs) On the one hand, in my view, it would be best if the region could take care of its problems by its own devices. Again, and uh, I don't mean to be impertinent, but the way I heard the previous speaker speak really is as if the regional people, the regional political orders should not even be asked or are irrelevant to the grand discussions that we're having. If I am right, and what we're witnessing is the unraveling of a colonial order under whatever guise, we really have to strip our language from the remnants of a colonial language as well, vocabulary as well. There is no institutional structure, though, to take care of the problems of the region. There is no security regime that could be the the enabler of of such a direction. There are basically four countries in the region that are worthy of the name of of being called a state. Three of them are non-Arab, and one of them is Arab. Israel, Iran, Turkey, and Egypt, however weak the Egyptian state might be today. 
Iran seeks recognition of its legitimate interests, but does so in a rather unseemly and annoying way. Israel, as I see it, is caught between its ideological follies and it is blindfolded, uh, is, it is its blindfolded concern for its own security uh, because of it behaves as if it is not part of the region organically. Iran and Israel are declared enemies, which is curious. Turkey and Israel are cross with one another. They don't speak. Egypt is trying to come back and is trying good relations with both Iran and Turkey, and where this will all lead is yet on a question mark for me. So I come back to my earlier point. We really need to think about the region within a different paradigm. And to, a good place to start with it all is to drop all this, in my judgment, nonsensical debates about whether Islam is compatible with capitalism or Islam is compatible with democracy. No religion, per se, can be compatible with a political system. The God of Judaism is a very vengeful guy. There are sections in the Bible that belie a Jesus that turns the other cheek. So I think we should try to imp imp uh, apply a secular language to our understanding of Muslim societies. There is no reason to think that Muslims have an extra gene which makes them irrational or they, they, it makes them not partake of the desires, aspirations, demands of other, part, of, of other peoples in other parts of the world. There is a dysfunctionality. That's not the religious thing. You can see in my country how Although we're becoming more religious, there are lots of things that I don't particularly like the way things are going. But you see, you can touch it, how life is becoming more and more secular. People are becoming more religious, but life is becoming more and more secular. By the way, Weber's Protestants were not secular people, right? After all, the calling was a religious calling, not a secular one. Finally, on Turkey. I like saying this in Germany, too. Every time the West finds itself in trouble, like there is a development where you really cannot judge which way it's going to go, something is evoked immediately. The Turkish model. <laughs> you know, the Soviet Union collapses... All these Istans come out. Nobody has ever heard of them. But, you know, they're Turkish and Muslim. You know, they're sitting on gas and oil. <laughs> Turkish model. Why? Because Turkey is Western. Secular, capitalist. Not really democratic, but at least it has a party system. It has holds elections. Then, Osama bin Laden attacks the United States. There is obviously a very disdainful dystopia there, jihadist dystopia. Everybody rediscovers the Turkish model. We get 16 billion extra dollars from the IMF. <laughs> and then the Arab awakening takes place, and everybody is again concerned, my God, what are these guys going to do? Turkey to the rescue. Now, I thought it was wrong then, and I think it is now proven that it is wrong. Um, nobody should pretend to be a model to anyone else. As I said, if anything, what Turkey shows to the other countries with which it has obviously historical relations, and what our ruling party, Justice and Development Party, shows to the political parties in those countries where the transition has already begun, with which it has kind of organic links, it has kinship relations with, is you've got to manage a country. You've got to give something to your populations materially. If you don't do this, you're not going to get anywhere. The question really is, can you do it? And what must you do in order to do it? What is the general framework within which you wish to operate? And lo and behold, Mr. Musri, I understand, called a colleague of mine who writes 
in a newspaper which has worked a lot about uh, developmental projects. He has something that is, can be relevant to Egypt. That is the kind of thing that Turkey can be helpful with, not whether or not Islam is compatible with democracy. Egypt is going to go through a very rough time. I'm sure it will be very difficult to be either a secular or a copt uh, in, in Egypt. Egypt is not going to turn liberal tomorrow, so long as it has a very strong Salafist movement. But the thing is, it's going to have to go through all these things. Perhaps we can ask ourselves, had the Mubarak regime or the Sadat regime not been supported so unconditionally for such a long period of time, maybe this transformation would have taken a different shape. But there is no point in going with ifs. So Turkey, therefore, found itself in a position to, be, to serve as an example. And what makes Turkey, in my view, peculiar particular is precisely the fact that it is a capitalist, secular, democratic country, which is a member of NATO, has a Muslim population, and seeks a fictional European Union in a very fictional way. <laughs> But even the fiction itself gives both the European Union and Turkey a lot of advantages, neither of which seem to actually recognize today. And I'll finish. In my view, there were four mistakes that Turkey had done, had committed in managing the Syria affair or mismanaging it. One was, as I said, it exposed the immense gap between its capacity and its aspirations. Second, it inadvertently perhaps advertently, dropped the ecumenical or secular language of its foreign policy, suddenly thinking the string of pearls, Muslim Brotherhood governments all over would be such a nice thing, and Turkey would be in the leading position. I don't think anybody demanded it. Engaging in regional power politics without taking care of its own problems, and those problems are both sectarian and, of course, ethnic, and when there is sectarian polarization and regionally, Uh, growing Kurdish nationalism, the first task for Turkey should have been to take care of its own problems that are related to those. As a result of all this, Turkey's aspiration to become a regional power is not going to go away, but it will be somewhat diminished, because I think Turkish foreign policy is going to be far more dependent on the U.S. Uh, than it had to be under the circumstances. The role of Europe in here, in my view, is extraordinarily important in terms of what the, role, the kind of role Turkey can play and the kind of direction Turkey is going to go to. To do as some Europeans do, which is to deny the fact that the Ottoman Empire was indeed a European empire, that for 200 years Turkey sought to be Western in its modernization, and to then do away with 65 years of common security partnership is erroneous. It is wrong on the part of Turkey to think that the European, that 200 years of westernized modernization did not become part of its identity, that its identity is only determined by the religion of its people. Soli, leave us something for the discussion, please. Last <laughs> sentence. <laughs> I tend to think that when Europe was Turkey's challenge, Turkey rose to that challenge. Europe dropped the ball. Turkey got very confident, maybe overconfident, tries to go its own way. I think it is still Europe's challenge now to see whether or not it can find a different way of bonding with Turkey and continuing the relation. Thank you. <laughs>